Welcome everyone uh, to the third episode of Talk to the Bot. This is a new initiative uh, we started to connect with educators, uh, students who are interested in understanding how the bot revolution is taking over the world of learning and education and institutions, how they are run, how assessments are done. And in today's session, very happy to welcome our dear friend Vishnu Karthik. He's the co-founder of Heritage Experiential Schools in Delhi, Durgaon area, and also has an illustrious career in education. So welcome, Vishnu. Really, really thank you. Audience. Thank you for having me over. You know, when I was just thinking of you, I said, okay, this is someone who's really been engaged in instructional design and, you know, with your interest in brain and learning studies, cognition, your degree at Harvard Graduate School of Education in the same field. There's so much we could cover, but I just wanted to give it a theme, let's say, you know, to see it from a Indian perspective, Indian school sort of uh, administrative perspective, and how the government has sort of instituted the NEP, NEP now. You could explain a little bit about NEP to, for our audiences and what changes do you see in general for okay. students in middle school, high school, and going forward to college. Great. So I think the great uh, segue to start this conversation, the NEP, because uh, I think in the field of education for India, uh, the NEP is a landmark milestone, I would say. Because in the last three decades, we have, our education policy had not been updated. Uh, it is quite shocking and surprising that in some ways as a nation, which is home to the world's largest school going population, I think we are racing against China. Just to give a context, we add one Australia every year into our classrooms every year across public schools, private schools, and we are such large. And we've not bothered or had the bandwidth at the leadership level to relook at the education policy uh, in it. So in that sense, it's a milestone. I mean, one could debate how effective, how uh, poor or uh, rich it is in its construct. But the fact is that we finally got around coming with a new education policy in itself as a milestone that needs to be acknowledged uh, in it. Uh, but like in any policy, uh, and in India especially, because education is a concurrent list, which is the responsibility of both the central governments and the 29 states and union territories, uh, a lot depends on how the policy which is designed by the central government gets rolled out by the state. Uh, and by the way, this construct is not unique to India. Many countries, including the US, for example, has education in the concurrent list. And it should be uh, that way, if you would ask me. There's always this argument that why can't you make education more centralized so that there's far more faster rollout of the policy. But I think given the diversity as a nation, uh, I think this is a good, good construct. Uh, uh, so it's going to take a lot of while for this, the policy to get implemented at the state level for students uh, who are currently in school to experience it. Uh, but there are three or four key, uh, I'm not going to get into the, I mean, we don't really don't have a, a lot of time to get into the details, but there are three or four big ideas, which I think is going to have a big impact in the way uh, children are learning, not just children, even uh, Adults, adolescents are learning at the tertiary, at the high secondary level uh, also, and higher education level also. I think one clearly is the focus on foundational literacy and numeracy. Uh, we've never done that. You know, one of the tragedies uh, as a nation when we were born uh, uh, in 1947, of course, the civilization is much older, but as a nation, we came into this political entity in 47. One of the priorities we did not pay attention to is primary education. I think is also some of the remnants of the uh, of our obsession with these the Soviet model. Uh, 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 in fact, that had a large impact in the way we looked at education. Uh, in fact, is very recently a professor. I don't recollect the name. He actually talked about uh, why, as a nation, we never prioritized primary education uh, right from the time. 1947, and that kind of just persisted over the last seven or decades, is that typically the Soviet or a communist model is to look, focus on higher education. Uh, so the, uh, they're obsessed with higher education, they're obsessed with large projects, for example, like spending to space, sending people to space, firing missiles across the continents, uh, anything which is scientific, for example, there's a lot of focus on those. And I think we embrace those things uh, for right or wrong reasons. 
Uh, but what happened in that price is so we built, started building IITs, we focus on Bakran Angle Dams, the ISROs, the IAMs, for example. Uh, but we really didn't think about uh, primary education. In fact, only in 2008 or 2009, education became a, a fundamental right in our country. Uh, till then, it was not a right. It is not a guarantee. The state never guaranteed that all kids will go to school. Uh, we still had, I think, on an average, three percent of our national income getting spent on education. But the standard should be about six, six and a half percent. We still haven't reached there yet, but we're almost there. Uh, so I think uh, we never focused on primary. Uh, contrasting to Japan, for example, that's a better model. Where uh, even way back in early nineteenth century, this was pre World War One, World War Two. Japan and the nation probably spent twenty six percent of the GDP on an average on primary education alone. And that's one of the reasons you find see that society as a highly one, highly developed, highly skilled uh, workforce. So the first time the NEP actually reversed the model and they said, look, uh, if you want to get a higher education right, you're going to start early. And uh, so they started focusing on foundation literacy and numeracy, which I believe is a far better model. In fact, one of the reasons are why, despite so many engineering colleges, despite so many universities coming up, despite so much of focus on vocational, you still don't have skilled manpower for our industry or the society. You still have most of our engineers, for example, are unskilled, they're not employable, and you know the facts uh, about how unemployable uh, our uh, youth are, despite spending a lot of money and time in universities in India. The reason also is not because the colleges do a bad job, uh, that could be part of the problem, but largely also they don't, really don't have a foundation. So in that sense, that's one. Second huge shift in NEP is uh, setting up an independent body for testing uh, at the school level. Uh, you know, Indians often forget uh, that we have a system where we really don't have a curriculum body in this country. So people often say, hey, CBSE, ICSE is there, but their DNA is not teaching and learning. The DNA is not curriculum. Uh, CBSE's primary mandate is actually testing. People often forget that. The, the mandate of CBSE why it was set up is to do the board exams. And in fact, till a few years back, they used to do the IITs, uh, the JEs, uh, the medical entrances, etc. So the DNA is testing. And uh, they really didn't have the bandwidth nor the organizational uh, uh, vision to think about teaching and learning deeply. And that's probably one of the reasons why we really haven't done a great job in skilling our children at the school level. Uh, unlike in the US, for example, the college board, for example, is one institute or central body which does the testing uh, through the SATs and the other forms of uh, high stake examinations. Uh, but the curriculum is designed by somebody else uh, in that sense. So uh, for the first time, the NEP talks about differentiating testing and teaching. Uh, so in, uh, that's a good move. And I think in another few years, you'll start seeing uh, more focus on independent testing and also holding uh, institutions of teaching accountable. Right now, the assessor is assessing what is being taught. So there is a lot of conflict of interest. There's no incentive for CBSC, for example, or even state boards, for example, or even ICC, for example, to actually give feedback to the system and say we are doing or not doing right. That's why your cutoffs are shooting up high because there is a great inflation. Uh, CBSC under pressure to show the world that they are doing well. Uh, I think that's the second thing which is done really well. The third thing I think it's, uh, which I really appreciate in the NEP is clarifying the language policy, uh, which currently uh, uh, what's happened is that uh, there is all, because we have so many uh, languages across states, uh, there's not been a very clear policy of, okay, I, am I going to learn Hindi, English? Am I going to, I think the government's focus now on three language model. It's very good, even from a cognitive neuroscience perspective, even from brain research tells you that every brain, like a GPS, uh, which requires three satellites for coordinates, every brain should have coordinates of three languages for its healthy development through the life cycle of an individual. So I think that's another great thing about the uh, uh, NEP. Uh, there are several things also, Arjun, like for example, focus on project-based learning, real life learning, for example, but those are more philosophical intents uh, rather than policy uh, initiatives. But the first three things I talked about is a tangible policy initiative the government has taken, uh, which I think we should appreciate. Uh, and we will see impact for good in our country moving forward. Oh, so thanks. That's quite an interesting overview. There are two 
two things mm-hmm. which uh, kind of link to the work we do with students in high school. Mm-hmm. So of course there are there are board exams and CBSC and uh, ISC and state boards and NIOS. And now there's the CUEP, which is another body that kind of okay. is uh, designed to be like the college board, perhaps in the US. And what you mentioned was the curriculum mandate to uh, work on pedagogy. The curriculum is okay. still relevant. It's still kind of the responsibility of uh, uh, individual schools or there are certain bodies which are now evolving in India which are focusing on curriculum like the middle school association mm-hmm. in the US for yeah, example. yeah 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 unfortunately like for example middle school is a classic example right mm-hmm. you really don't have an equivalent in India uh, because uh, we are thoroughly governed for some reason uh, by the testing bodies like the CBSC really influences the life of a child, at least from grade eight upwards, if not lower. Uh, even for primary that are brought, uh, there's definitely contours which CBC gives you, which schools have to adhere to. That's probably one of the reasons uh, India is one of the fastest regions for international curriculums to grow. Because every school, every parent uh, are looking for alternatives than the boxed curriculum which CBC provides. So the answer to your question, are there independent curriculum bodies? The answer is no. I don't think we've reached there yet, but NEP is paved way for it. See the Middle East, uh, MSEA, CIS, for example, New England uh, States Association, some of these curriculum accreditation bodies are independent, not-for-profit private bodies. They don't have any influences of the any government, but they at least give you a certain roadmap, validation, and accreditation on school quality. Even they don't vet any curriculum, they are curriculum agnostic, but at least they tell a parent whether there is enough quality, rigor, uh, and even things like policies which are student friendly, which are child centric, etc. Uh, mm-hmm. And those are accreditation which parents, universities can use. In India, there is no body. I mean, there is no way as a parent today I can know, okay, how was heritage schools which I work with, how are they doing? There's just perception, right? Uh, in fact, for lack of good uh, metrics like uh, independent accreditations the nearest proxy is grade 12 performances which is unfortunate so there's this race for every school to do well because that's the only way parents unfortunately understand whether school is good or not but you and i know uh, that is that is no indication of any rigor or quality of a school uh, but NEP, i think has set the ball rolling i'm hoping in the next 10 years uh, good institutions uh, will emerge which actually focus on the process, which is quality of teaching and learning, culture, uh, student leadership opportunities, et cetera, uh, which is independent of CBSE's mandate, which is independent of the curriculum compulsion, which is independent of the high stake testing. Yeah, I think this is uh, what is the meat of, uh, you know, how maybe AI and other generative mm-hmm. AI sort of tools, ChatGPT and others mm-hmm. are either a resource or a big bane for mm-hmm. you know uh, in institutions and how it's the interaction with the student and to have mm-hmm. some standards of measuring their 21st century skills um, mm-hmm. actively by mm-hmm. trained teachers mm-hmm. to actually make a difference in the lives of students who are then ready for hmm. new jobs that will be created because of changing trends and yeah, changing yeah. technologies. So you mentioned project-based learning and in your career, I've seen you've done some interesting things. You went across hmm. on a cargo liner for 14 days and yeah. you've also kind of taken risks in terms of just uh, trying out, you know, new curriculum designs at your school creating new spaces so you already think a lot about project-based learning based on your work mm-hmm. how do you think can, we can define driving questions for projects and even set standards for achievement i know it's a pretty open-ended question mm-hmm. but very often we we see that in ib schools kids and your school has uh, the ib program so there's obviously some level of uh, understanding of how it can be delivered but how would you say meet a uh, cbsc trained teacher and say okay this is this is what you should do in like three steps or whatever five steps 
to include project based learning in your classroom environment i, I really wish uh, it was that simple to just give a five step or a 10 step uh, protocol for teachers to make project based learning uh, to me and this is uh, we are, i mean you would know heritage is an experiential learning school so the school was founded i just want to clarify also arjun that i'm not the co-founder of heritage experiential school i only co-founded the international school uh, manit and there are a couple of other people are the co-founder i joined 3 years after the school started but right from the beginning uh, uh, the school uh, vision was to provide real life authentic learning experiences that's how the vision is uh, and uh, after almost a decade and a half of spending and iterating and figuring it out what works well uh, we realized that uh, project based learning to begin with is actually about culture it's not about a set of uh, it's not a curriculum it's not uh, it's a culture a culture of making students leaders of, of their own learning process uh, and making teachers uh, learners of the teaching process uh, because in projects uh, teachers also have to iterate uh, uh, it's also about collaboration teachers have to have a lot of planning time for example the teaching load of an average teacher at heritage school is a good 40% lesser than any other school reason is that time where you should be teaching in a traditional school uh, we spend a lot of that time actually planning with other uh, teachers so that's in, in many ways it's just a mindset and a culture to begin with second of course there are a set of protocols but those protocols are not something manual driven it is something which is built uh, over a period of time through observation coaching peer review peer feedback so there's a lot of uh, we call it the professional learning community so if if teachers collectively get together and give each other feedback and there are expert teacher we call them instructional coaches who go around working with teachers to providing the feedback then the craft of teaching a project also moves up uh, third is also about curriculum design uh, which is around how do you break the silos of disciplines and subject and make them converge around a real life problem which students deeply care about so instead of teaching for example photosynthesis or uh, the recent example i was just talking to some parents in a workshop last week is if you want to really learn one of the things about our generation for example is we really don't know much about health you know of course some of us would probably have taken would have done some research they're probably more health conscious but that's more of a deliberate effort but when we finish school we did all the stupid things in terms of eating junk food etc despite the fact that we spent grade 6 and grade 8 uh, in science talking about vitamins minerals etc in fact most adults in their 40s or even 50s wouldn't know the difference between vitamins and minerals and proteins uh, although these are concepts which we learn in science uh, and the reason is that you know we really didn't have relevance we really we learned it through the very didactic way of memorizing etc so the way heritage would tackle this is that uh, in grade 6 and grade 7 uh, there are there is a project which we call it the my body my uh, so the entire real life project is about uh, designing nutritional menus for the in the cafeteria, uh, running a health camp for parents. For all of these things to do, they need to understand that how do you measure nutrition, how do you read labels, what's the difference between vitamins, what are the different kinds of vitamins, what are the sources. Uh, so there are a lot of primary research they got to do, a lot of secondary research they got to do. Uh, so the, you learn these scientific concepts, you, you learn these concepts around your body or on nutrition, not through the science textbook or chapters. But through solving a real life problem of redesigning the menu of the cafeteria uh, or conducting a health camp for all the parents in the school uh, and you learn science through that and it is not just through science and the english or literacy literacy teachers would uh, also design some assignments around you know report writing uh, the mathematics teachers uh, would probably design about primary research secondary research so one project would at least have three or four disciplines converging in those things uh, so project based learning is around uh, solving real problems through the year if they're not short projects that's another thing very key thing because short project most schools do like summer vacation projects uh, winter projects but these are semester long projects you've got to stay with the problem through the different milestones uh, and critical skills of report writing for example primary research secondary research interviewing all that gets built uh, and the feedback is not on the final product but on the process uh, in it so of course with ai coming in uh, 
the opportunities to do deeper research only expanded uh, and we're pretty excited about the future uh, of the role of any language based uh, ai or generative ai for example uh, in making projects more uh, rigorous in that sense yeah yeah that's that's great you know i think i really like your overall approach to defining project based learning and how it's the culture within <laughs> and also how you know uh, the key is to have driving questions so that students feel that they've mm. been given a role to play where, where they need to then create or do something in your mm. example you mentioned that you know they were given the role to be say the catering service company and create yes. uh, a, a kind of menu which was exciting and at the same time so that the students who kind of consume that food from the uh, from the menu they get the right nutrients minerals proteins like you mentioned and so it's very yes. interesting that um, you know in defining uh, the problem and helping creating a culture where the ecosystem supports yes. uh, that ownership yes. from the students we did you did briefly mention about ai but instead of just focusing on project based learning and you know kind of expediting the students journey to uh, sort of grasp all this where do you see uh, the role of assessments would change mm. if students uh, are if microsoft say for instance has adopted ai mm. within its suite and they have this copilot which yes. uh, kind of includes mm. chat gpt and other things where do you think uh, technology uh, is coming in as uh, a disruptor in particularly in assessing students work yeah, yeah. the interesting question uh, arjun uh, see one increase even before the advent of chat gpt over the last few months of course chat gpt has been around for some time but i think it came into popular uh, you know memory only in the recent a uh, few months uh, but even before that i think around the world we know that the assessment trends are moving towards measuring skill competencies and more finer things than tangible things like you know not uh, knowledge or facts and etc and i think even cbsc has moved a lot towards uh, uh, i mean they call it the higher order thinking skills uh, and that's that's a very positive thing uh, in fact, even civil services, for that matter, forget about you don't have to go far. Even back home, some of the more traditional forms of recruiting civil servants in our country, uh, even those examinations have actually moved application oriented uh, uh, in it. Uh, with the advent of AI, it's it's going to get even more difficult to actually assess. Like for example, I really don't know. I'm sure that's something which you are engaging far more. Uh, what's the role of student essays now in admissions? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure you're going to in a few months, if not years. You could have some of the fantastic essays coming out, and that'd be very difficult to find out who's actually written it, uh, right? So the definitely assessments are going to change, but assessments are going to we really don't. I frankly I don't know what's going to happen, but this much is this much is clear. I think any progressive school or any progressive assessment body will embrace uh, uh, AI or any technology tool. Uh, th the assessment is not for creation. Uh, assessment will be will be as a role of an editor and a curator. Uh, uh, in fact, in fact, I was just reading a uh, hearing a podcast last week by Timothy uh, Dartmouth. He's from MIT and he's a leading expert uh, in AI, especially in, in academics. And one of the things he said was that uh, the role of creators will actually come down, especially in the areas of legal, uh, even in areas of medicines, for example. Uh, a lot of it can just will just system generate it, especially these generative AI are getting smarter and smarter. Uh, but the role of human is still about curating it. The role of the human is still about being a master editor uh, in it. And assessments will move towards uh, those. Also, assessments, even say, uh, Bill Gates said this, you know, uh, we often uh, overestimate what any technology can do in the short term but underestimate what technology can do in the long term. Uh, so uh, a lot of the fears which teachers or parents or students express now, I think it's uh, overhyped. It is going to take a while for it to get reflected in some of the uh, art examinations. Uh, 
uh, it's not that all jobs are going to disappear immediately. You will still need students to write quality writing. You still need students to write persuasive text. You still need students to you know create stuff. Uh, but in the long run, of course, uh, some roles will not be there for, the, for which we're getting trained for. Uh, and your assessments are going to be around areas where system uh, uh, technology will, will find it very difficult to replicate. Like even now, uh, like the, I mean, there are some articles I'm sure even you would have come across. Uh, any political stand, ChatGPT doesn't know how to respond. Uh, any inference on history itself, ChatGPT can't respond. So anything to do with ethics, morality, compassion, for example, the most of, some of those which makes it really human, uh, chat GPT struggles. There are clear biases which AI seems to have uh, in some of the questions. Uh, you, know, you just need to ask the uh, the more tougher questions you ask, which needs to take a stand. I think you can see biases come through, uh, or it can just draw a blank. Uh, mm -hmm. So there are limitations, uh, and but assessments will be towards application, uh, will be towards uh, things around morality, compassion, and like I said, editing. Uh, and being a curator. Okay, I'm shifting gears now because you know I love asking this question to every educator I meet, and it's more to do with. Uh, in your case, I've seen that your interest in yoga and Vedanta have stuck with you for a long time. I think you're still part of a Chinmaya Yoga That's right. organization. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and when you look at youth today and at any time actually not just today there's always bound to be certain unintelligent design principles uh, young people or any of people of any age lead their lives and hence get very confused and distraught uh, which could lead to uh, negative self talk and then low self esteem or any other manifestation which then blows up you know in later in life perhaps as mental health issues just to kind of give it a broad brush. What do you think uh, ancient wisdom texts from Asia, elsewhere, anywhere in the world have to offer? And how have you personally used it in your life, in your family? Mm -hmm. And I know that you have a daughter who's been a gift and at the same time, a huge responsibility mm -hmm. for you. That's so right. how do you link all of this uh, uh, in your life and also see it come to play in the work that you do at service in the school shaping lives of students and indirectly their families? Actually, very difficult question. I really don't have an answer. But when I look back, the whole choice, and I'm sure that's for you and for many of us who are in the field of education, working with youngsters, uh, the whole purpose of actually choosing to work with youngsters uh, is in some way your own seeking. Uh, Early on, I had the, I mean, like yourself, I had a mentor. Uh, and one of the things I realized through my conversations with him is that my purpose in life is to help people realize, help myself realize my potential through helping others realize their potential. And school is just one construct or a platform. Uh, it's a great excuse, in fact, to have conversations with students in a school construct. Ideally, I wouldn't have loved, I wouldn't have wanted to be in a school. I would have probably had a little more freer structure. But I also realized uh, the utility of a structure like school to reach out uh, to youngsters uh, in it. So for me, uh, my work is in some ways, in fact, not some ways, in, in, in totality, it is the purpose uh, of my own seeking. Uh, and I mean, I, I don't differentiate between professional, personal, everything is all one. I think that's something which is our Asian contribution to the world. Uh, we don't have silos of work-life balance or, you know, uh, uh, I mean, we see life as uh, into there's nothing called work or personal life. So the way I would view my daughter is the way I would view my work uh, in it. Uh, and it's been a uh, journey. So if you ask me, ideally, school should have the uh, the courage uh, in some sense to uh, help children experience this, help children think about uh, you know larger purposes in their own life. Uh, for me, the best gift to children is not happiness or skills. The best gift is that help them find their own meaning uh, in it. And that's all All spiritual seeking is about. Eventually, if you, if you are pursued of meaning, you'll eventually land uh, and in seeking your uh, the real truth uh, of this existence uh, in it. So I really hope uh, that through our work, uh, more and more individuals, when I say individuals, I'm not, not just talking about students or 
uh, in our school. Even adults, uh, uh, one of the initiatives we started recently is called Center for Conscious Parenting. Uh, it's actually a platform, and that's something which I reflected when we had Mira, my daughter, five years back, that as a parent of a young child, you it's such a sacred responsibility that you want to do the right things, uh, not to the child, but to even to yourself so that you're ready uh, uh, for the child. Uh, so we cre created this platform. It's kind of a collective of getting different people and having conversations with parents that what could be some of the things you could reform? Because children are the best excuse for us to change ourselves. Uh, and that way, by the way, working, I'm sure you would agree, working with youngsters is the best spiritual uh, sadhana you could have because that kind of gives a certain sense of urgency to be a better human being every day. Uh, so I've become an evolved human being. So I, I, uh, better than what I was 10 years back or 15 years back. And that's something even our teachers and parents would recognize that, you know, if you're part of a good mindful community, uh, if you're a mindful parent, uh, you will get better as a human being uh, every day. And that's in some ways uh, a sadhana in, in itself. I don't know, I've given you a very kitschy answer, but that's a very <laughs> no, no, definitely. It's a very it's important def question. You touched upon all the right things and uh, so much uh, I can relate to in the work we do with our students and even young team members yes. at the same time. Because I see uh, young college graduates who work with us. Uh, almost going through similar sort of mindsets or issues which our high school kids have. So it's about helping yeah, them, yeah. you know, work through yes. their, uh, uh, their true potential. And hence it mm -hmm. becomes, like you said, a seva or a sadhana. Wonderful. I think this is just a great way to end uh, our talk, but I think we should definitely continue uh, yes, right. Yes. These conversations and bring mm -hmm. to light more issues, uh, not just in mm -hmm. our network in Gurgaon, but perhaps mm -hmm. across uh, communities in education around the world. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Arjun. Thank you so much for having me over. I've heard a lot about your good work and finally get a chance to talk to you uh, around very important questions in our lives. Thank you so much for having me over.